I'd like to say a few words about our place in the universe. But before I can go into that in depth, we have to talk about a couple of things. Because the universe is big. It's huge on a scale that defies human comprehension. The planets, the distance between stars, the distance between galaxies is so enormous that we can't use regular measurement systems to even talk about these structures. But also, the universe is in motion, still buzzing, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. So when we have this discussion, we don't talk about our exact place in the universe, but instead we talk about our relative place, because we are always in motion, and we can tell where we are compared to other things. So, in order to have this discussion tonight, I'm going to break the universe into five levels of scale that will make it easier for us to understand, when we look up in the sky, what exactly we're looking at. So we'll start simple, here at Style. Here we are sitting in a very stable spot. Compared to the city of Munich, we're at rest. But in fact, at this moment, we are all moving in that direction, which is east, at 1,000 kilometers per hour. Now the good news is the building moves with us, so do the cars, the streets, the air, everything is moving that way because every 24 hours, we, relative to the center of the Earth, of our Earth's axis, make a 24-hour journey at a very high speed. In fact, the distance is quite fast. We live here north of the equator, 48 degrees north, and at this latitude, we're going to move in the next 24 hours about 24,000 kilometers. Now, the next level of scale up from here is to go up to the solar system to look at the sun and then the system that we are in, which is the Earth and the moon moving as a, as a unit around the sun. So when we get to this level here, now things are going to change a touch. We are 150 million kilometers from the sun. And those of you that can do a little bit of math will know that that comes out to 950 million kilometers once around the sun. We travel that distance, of course, every year. And if you take that and, and you break it down into the amount that we're moving right now, our system is traveling at 100,000 kilometers per hour. 100 times faster than we're moving around on the surface of the Earth. That helps us to get a sense of that scale. Now before we can go to level three in our discussion, I want to clarify a particular topic. And that topic is the light year. Now, you being a crowd that's interested in science, you've probably heard of the light year before, but I'd like to say a few things about that because a light year is not a measure of time. It's a measure of distance. It's a measure precisely of how far light travels in one year. So let's think about this. If we're standing here at the sun and a photon of light now emerges from the surface of the sun, and begins moving at the speed of light, that photon will travel for a little more than eight minutes to reach the Earth. Now, I just said a moment ago that the Earth is 150 million kilometers from the Sun. The speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. If you divide this by this, you're gonna get that it takes about eight and a third minutes for that photon of light to get to the Earth. So you can even think of this as a distance. You could say that we here on Earth are eight and a third light minutes from the Sun. That's a distance measurement. Now if that same photon of light keeps traveling, after one day, after 24 hours, that photon of light will now be in interstellar space. That is to say it will have left the solar system and will be on its way to the next star. So a light day, you're out of the solar system. After 365 of those, there's your light year. 
If you go another 4.4 of those, you're going to get to the next nearest star system to the Earth, which is called Alpha Centauri. So that little photon of light took 4.4 years. And in that time, because one light year is 10 trillion kilometers, we can say it traveled 44 trillion kilometers, which is a big mouthful. Or it traveled for 4.4 light years. Got it? So the bottom line is, a light year is a measure of distance. And from this point forward, I'm only going to talk about light years. Because that's going to be pretty important at level three, which is when we talk about a galaxy. And in fact, I'll focus in on our own Milky Way galaxy, where we live. Now, a galaxy is a massive collection of stars that are bound together gravitationally. And in our case, our galaxy has about 250 billion stars. And the distances are vast. From one end to the other, 100,000 Light years. Remember, I just said a moment ago, Alpha Centauri, four, right? So here we are, 25,000 times that distance across our galaxy. So here we are, that would be our sun, and our planets going around, including here. And in fact, there's motion, because galaxies, as you can see, our Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. It has these beautiful spiral arms. We're all moving, we meaning the Earth, the Sun, the solar system, all the stars you can see in the sky tonight, everything is moving in this beautiful, grand, cosmic dance that takes 200 million years to traverse once around that center of our own Milky Way galaxy. That's the motion happening at the galactic level. Now, Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, the early astronomers thought, well, we're in a galaxy, so it seems a lot of stars, and there might be more, but they had no way to prove it. That proof didn't come until just 100 years ago, when Edwin Hubble was able to discern with very powerful telescopes, and in fact, we can also see objects that are much, much more distant than 100,000 light years. And as soon as we began to spot those with the better telescopes of that era, we could quickly determine that there were not a few, not hundreds or thousands, but just an enormous number of galaxies that we could see in the night sky. But the astronomers also discovered that, in fact, these galaxies come in clusters. They group together gravitationally. And then there's vast, empty space. And then the next galaxy cluster. And that takes us to the next level in our little journey here, to the local galactic group. That's our home group. This is our galactic neighborhood, so to speak. And this is a pretty big structure. So in order to make sense of this, 10 million light years across. Now that is, think back to the Milky Way, one galaxy, 100,000 light years. So now we've gone up by a factor of 100. So here's our Milky Way galaxy. And in fact, once again, we're not sitting still, we're all buzzing around in motion. And the motion that we have today is taking us in the direction of the Andromeda Galaxy, which you can see over there on the lower right. The Andromeda Galaxy is the biggest galaxy in our local galactic group. There's 54 galaxies. Andromeda is number one, we're number two. We're about two thirds the size of Andromeda, and we're heading toward it. And in fact, in four and a half billion years, we're going to cross right through it. Isn't that neat? Now, it goes further. We're not yet at the top level because in more recent years, in just the last couple of decades, our ability to analyze these distant galaxies got even better. And astronomers at the University of Hawaii did a study of 8,000 galaxies and began to look at the motion of all those galaxies. So 8,000 galaxies encompasses a lot more than just our local moon. It was all around our section of the universe. And in doing this analysis, what they discovered is what they call a superstructure that they named Lani Akea, which is Hawaiian because, well, they're at the University of Hawaii. And Lani and Akea means enormous heaven. It's a beautiful name, isn't it? And this Lani Akea superstructure they saw something interesting happening because it wasn't just 
lots of galaxies out there in our neighborhood in the universe. But in fact, there was a motion, there was a movement connecting all these galaxies. That's why they call it a superstructure. And that motion, in fact, uh, by the way, five million light years across, million light years across, so we're talking about big distances. There's our local group. Here we are. And now let's take this to the next level. All of these galaxy clusters are in motion when they match the motion. This is an image now of, you see these thread-like lines with arrows that are pointing in. In fact, all of the galaxies are moving. We're out here in one of the threads, but we all are moving in the direction of something that they have named the Great Attractor. <laughs> What is the great attractor? I don't know. But they're working on it. And before long, I'm sure we'll discover even greater superstructures. So that brings us to the universe, or more precisely said, the observable universe in all of its glory here. 46 billion light years that we have identified and documented. But we say the observable universe because that's what we can see, because we can only perceive in the realm of science things that we can see and measure. But what we know is that beyond this border, there are further distances that are yet unexplored. And given today's technology, they will remain out there and unexplored for the time being. Now, you don't have to take all this, because I'm saying it, you don't have to take my word for it. In fact, you can go outside and see this. So this is a little diagram that I put together from an astronomy package that I use on my laptop. It's called Sky Safari. And many of you on your mobile phones probably have different kinds of astronomy maps where you can map what the sky looks like on a given night at a given place. And I put this up with a view to the south to give you a little tour of these superstructures and these structures as we can see them right here. For example, when you look to the south, you can find Jupiter, and Saturn, and Pluto, and Uranus, and Neptune, and the Moon. And they all follow along a path in the sky that's called the ecliptic. That is to say, when you look out into the sky and you follow this path, what you're doing is you're looking into our own solar system. And now, if we had a little bit darker sky, because this is, of course, a map of how things would look if it was a bit darker outside, and you go from the southwest of the sky up to the northeast, there's this beautiful, fuzzy band of light. And that's our own Milky Way. That's us in our Milky Way galaxy, looking out at it on the edge. And if you go a step further, when you look a little bit more to the northeast, you're going to spot Andromeda, the Andromeda galaxy. That is to say, our big brother, if you will, here on our local galactic group, up there in that part of the sky. So everything we are here is the Milky Way, and you can look out there and say, oh, another big galaxy out there. And because we live in the Northern Hemisphere, we can't see all the stars in the night sky, we're limited. But if we could travel south of the equator, we could go down, uh, if you're in South America, Australia, whatever, you could then spot a constellation called Centaurus. And when you're looking in that direction, you just have to know and trust that what you're looking at is the direction of the great attractor, that place that is drawing all of the stars, the galaxies, the galaxy groups, the Maniakia, to some direction. So why am I telling you all of this tonight? First of all, we are privileged people. We stand on the shoulders of the giants who came before us. Newton and Galileo and Copernicus and Hubble and the scientists at the University of Hawaii. Those who have shown us the breadth and extraordinary depth of our universe. They've given us a gift and we can celebrate that for we as a people have more knowledge about our own cosmos than anybody in the history of humankind. But the second reason 
and the deeper meaning for me is that we can go outside and look at it and see and know and understand our place in the universe. And having this knowledge enables us to better appreciate that we are just but one people traveling together through the universe on planet Earth. Thanks. There is a first question in the second row. that are pushing us away. What the scientists at the University of Hawaii did with the 8,000 galaxies they study is they normalized for that movement. And they said if you ignore that movement, which is a macro movement across the entire universe, and just localize on our region, then they saw, if you will, a macro effect on top of the general expansion. So, it, it, you know, it's, it's like if everyone's running away, but they're all running in one direction, you can say, well, they're running away from each other, but they're kind of in one path. That's the nature of the Would you mind, where's the cube, the microphone cube? Okay, there's another question just behind the camera. Would you mind to throw it? Can you catch it? Marcus will catch it. He's tall. Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. There we go. Um, on the slide with the uh, radio ratio, where you highlighted the um, converging lines to the great attractor, attractor. Yeah. there were also different lines converging in different places. Correct. Um, what were those? So, uh, at the same time that we've now discerned that we have a Laniakia on that very photo, on that very image on the left and on the right, there were actually two other superstructures. Um, we don't have, we haven't fully mapped those yet, but what we do know is that they're not Laniakia. So we know that there's another superstructure here, it has a name, I forget what it is. And there's another one over here, and I think it was called uh, Perseus or something like that. Yeah, it's another one over here. So there are two more that we've identified, but we can't, we haven't mapped them fully yet. Yeah, so there, I have confidence that if we get together in this room in 20 years and redo this talk, we're going to know a lot more stuff about those other ones, right? <laughs> it's just the nature of science. You got it. Okay, so for my question, if you could share some light, how do you actually measure the distances on the supercluster level? It's really interesting, so what were the challenges, or like in general, what was the process of actually understanding it on such a huge scale? Yeah, on average, when you're measuring distance in the universe, particularly when you get to these extremely distant objects, um, let me flip it around. When things are close to us, yeah, uh, we can measure, you know, we're, we're traveling a very long distance, 150 million kilometers around, so 300 million kilometers end to end every year on the Earth. And when we look at a distant object, we look at what's called parallax, right? Because if we're here and then we move over here, six months later we measure the same spot, we can say, hmm, looks like it shifted, that's parallax. So for objects that are relatively near in the galaxy, we can use that method. For things outside, we use redshift. Because 
as mentioned, because we are moving apart from each other for the most part, we can say, well, the distance to Andromeda, 2.4 million light years, we see this much redshift. If we see even more when you get further out to these more distant objects, we can then estimate the distance out to those further objects. There's more to it than that, but that's the quick version. Thank you, Paul, very much. I'd like to.